Good morning, everyone. First off, I'd like to thank all of you guys for choosing to attend my presentation today. But before I get started, I wanted to address the potential confusion around the topic of my talk today. Unfortunately, this won't be about the city of Brooklyn, New York, or its beautiful bridge. Um, hopefully, you guys came here to learn about this Brooklyn. So people ask me all the time when I place orders for swag, such as t-shirts, hats, or stickers with our custom logo on it, are you sure you meant to spell Brooklyn like that, with an I and not a Y? And I always have to reassure them that I did intend to spell Brooklyn like this. So where did we get the name Brooklyn with an I? Well, the definition of a brook is a stream. And at LinkedIn, we always, tried to like, we always like to try to find clever ways to incorporate the word in in our team names, event names, project names. So if you put Brook and In together, well, that gives you Brookin, but that sounds an awful lot like Broken, and that's not what we wanted to name our product after. So instead, if you combine the word Brook and LinkedIn, well, that gives you Brook LinkedIn, which sounds uh, maybe a little bit better, but still a little bit awkward. So what we did was we simply dropped the latter half of that word and that's how we came up with Brooklyn. Here's a picture of me wearing a t-shirt with our custom logo on it. My name is Celia Kung, and I manage the data pipelines team, which includes Brooklyn, as part of the streams infrastructure org at LinkedIn. So at LinkedIn, it's sort of a tradition that whenever we're introducing ourselves to an audience or a group of people for the first time, to share something about us that is not on our LinkedIn profile. So something that's not on my LinkedIn profile is I have four pet cats that I adopted, and I've taught one of them to do a high five. Um, so surprisingly, it's not that difficult to teach a cat uh, to do a high five. It took probably less than a week. Um, and this is only true if they're highly motivated by food, like I am. OK, so now let's dive into the presentation. Here's an, a little bit of an overview of what I'll be covering today. First, I'll give a brief background and motivation on why we needed to build a service like Brooklyn. And then I'll talk about some of the scenarios that Brooklyn was designed to handle, including some of the real use cases for it within LinkedIn. Then I'll give an overview of the Brooklyn architecture. And lastly, I'll talk about where Brooklyn is today and our plans for the future. So when we talk about streams infrastructure, one of the main focuses is serving nearline applications, which are those that require a near real-time response, so in the order of seconds to maybe minutes. There are thousands of such applications at LinkedIn. For example, the live search indices or notifications that you might get when one of your connections has changed their job. Because these nearline applications are always processing, they are requiring continuous and low latency access to data. And this data could be spread out across multiple data systems, database systems. For example, at LinkedIn, we used to store most of our source of truth data in Oracle, and as we grew, we built our own document database called Espresso. We then started to store some data in MySQL and Kafka, and LinkedIn acquired some companies that built their applications on top of AWS, and then LinkedIn itself got acquired by Microsoft, which called for the need to stream data in and out of Azure. So over the years, LinkedIn data became spread out across many heterogeneous data systems. And to continue to support all of these nearline applications that needed this continuous and low latency access to all of this data, we needed to build the right framework to support streaming from these various sources. From a company's perspective, we wanted to allow our application developers to focus on application logic and data processing logic and not on the movement of data. So the streams infrastructure team at LinkedIn was tasked with finding the right infrastructure to enable this. When we had most of our data in Oracle and our document store called Espresso, we had actually built a change data capture system called Databus, which was used to capture changes made to, data, made to the databases and stream them to nearline applications. Um, but the problem with this is that it didn't scale very well because the solution for streaming data out of Oracle was pretty specialized and separate from the solution to stream data out of Espresso, despite the fact that these two were both in the same product called Databus. And at this point, we needed to add support for even more sources, uh, like Kafka and Event Hubs. And so what we could have done was we could have written separate streaming systems as part of Databus to support this. 
But what we really learned was that building separate and specialized solutions to stream data to and from each different system is, it really slows down our development and is extremely hard to manage. What we really needed was a centralized, managed, and extensible service that could continuously deliver data in near real time to our applications. And this led us to the, de to the development of Brooklyn. So now that you know a little bit about the motivation on why we needed to build Brooklyn, what is Brooklyn? Brooklyn is a streaming data pipeline service that has the ability to propagate data from many source types to many destination types. It is also multi-tenant, which means that it can run several thousands of streams simultaneously and all within a single cluster. Each of these data pipelines can be individually configured and dynamically provisioned, meaning that you don't need to make a bunch of static config file changes and deploy a new cluster every time you just want to uh, spin up a new data pipeline. And perhaps the biggest reason why we built Brooklyn was to make it easily extensible to plug in support for additional sources and destinations going forward. So we really built Brooklyn with extensibility in mind. This is sort of like a high level picture of what this looks like. On the right hand side, you have all of these nearline applications that are interested in uh, streaming data from a variety of sources, which you have on the left hand side. And Brooklyn is responsible for capturing these changes and shipping these events to any variety of destinations where our applications can asynchronously consume from. So for sources, we mainly focus on two types, which are databases and messaging systems, with the most heavily used databases at LinkedIn being Espresso and Oracle, and the most heavily mes used messaging system being Kafka. Um, and at LinkedIn, most of our applications consume from Kafka as a destination. So now that you have a high level picture of what Brooklyn looks like, um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the scenarios that Brooklyn was designed to handle. And most of these fall into two major buckets. The first scenario is what is known as change data capture, which involves capturing live updates made to databases and streaming them in the form of a low latency change stream. And to show you what I mean by change data capture, I'll walk through a very simple example of how change data capture is used at LinkedIn. So suppose that there is a LinkedIn member whose name is Mochi, who updates her LinkedIn profile to reflect her recent job switch. She used to work as a litter box janitor at a company called Scoop, and now she is working at a company called ZZZ Catnip Dispensary, where she works as a sales clerk. As a social professional network, LinkedIn wants to inform Mochi's colleagues of her new job change. So for example, this is the view of Rolo, who is one of Mochi's connections. And we want to show this update on Rolo's newsfeed so that he can easily engage in this update by commenting or liking um, this post to congratulate his friend on her new role. One way to enable this use case is, <clears throat> so Mochi's profile data is stored in a a database called a member database and a profile table. And one way to enable this use case is to have the newsfeed service constantly query the member database directly to try to detect whenever a profile has changed. And this can work at somewhat of a small scale. But suppose that you have another um, application called search indice service that is also interested in listening to changes that are made to member profile data. Because, for example, if a user searches for ZZZ catnip dispensary on LinkedIn, they want Mochi to show up in the search results of this new company and no longer in the search resu results of her, uh, of her previous company. So again, the search industry service could also constantly query the member database doing select star queries um, to try to figure out what has changed since the last time that it ran a select star query. But <clears throat> you can imagine that there are many such applications that are interested in listening to changes made to member profile data to power critical applications in the LinkedIn um, site, such as notifications or title standardization. So they could all follow a similar approach, but as the size of your database grows or the number of applications grows, you are at risk of bringing down the database if you continue to do this because these select star queries are extremely expensive. 
So you don't want a live read or write to a, LinkedIn's profile, to a LinkedIn member's profile on the live site to be slow or not work just because there are a bunch of uh, back-end jobs that are also trying to listen to the live database. So how do we do this? How do we solve this? We solve this by a known pattern called change data capture, where in these applications, don't query the live database directly, but they instead listen to these live updates by consuming from what is called as a change stream. And Brooklyn is the force behind capturing the updates made to the database and streaming them to the change stream. There are several advantages to doing it this way. First, you get good isolation between the applications and the, live, and the online resource because they don't compete for, for resources on the live database. And secondly, um, these applications and databases can scale independently of, of each other. And applications can be at different points in the change timeline. So because they are reading from a change stream and not from the live database itself, each application can just be at different points in time. This is what the setup of change data capture looks like with Brooklyn um, at LinkedIn. So as you can see here, Brooklyn is the one that's responsible for capturing the live updates made to the member database, and it streams them to a messaging system as a destination. Um, in, this, in most cases at LinkedIn, it's Kafka. And all of these various services that need to know about changes made to member profile data can just read from the messaging system, or Kafka in this case. And because Kafka has great read scaling, it can handle a bunch of different services consuming the data from Kafka at the same time and at various points in time too. So you can have an application that's consuming from um, the latest data, which is the very tail end of the topic, or you can have applications consuming from the earliest start in time, which is the, the head of the topic. And Kafka can handle that. So the second major scenario that Brooklyn is designed to handle is what is known as a streaming bridge. A streaming bridge is applicable when you want to move data between different environments. So for example, you can use Brooklyn to stream data between different cloud services like AWS and Azure. Um, you can also use Brooklyn to uh, copy data between different clusters and even across data centers. This is a hypothetical example of Brooklyn being used as a streaming bridge. In this example, Brooklyn is consuming from two Kinesis streams in AWS and writing the data into two Kafka topics um, on link within LinkedIn on-premise. That same Brooklyn cluster is consuming from two Kafka topics, two different Kafka topics, and writing the data into two event hubs within Azure. So anytime you want to stream data from X to Y is when a streaming bridge is applicable. Having a streaming bridge allows organizations to enforce policies. So for example, you might have a policy that states that any data coming out of a particular source must be encrypted because it has um, PII data. Or you might have a policy that states that any data coming with, into your organization um, needs to be of a particular format like JSON or Avro. And you can just configure your data pipelines to enforce such policies. And it makes it easier for organizations to manage if all of their data pipelines are within one centralized service instead of having many applications running their own one-off pipelines. But perhaps the biggest streaming bridge scenario at LinkedIn is to mirror Kafka data. So Kafka is used extremely heavily within LinkedIn. And as most of you know, it even came out as a project coming out of LinkedIn. And we use it to store all sorts of data like logging, tracking, and metrics information. So we use Brooklyn to aggregate all of this Kafka data between our, uh, from all of our data centers to make it easy to access and process from one centralized location. Brooklyn is also used heavily to move enormous amounts of data between LinkedIn and Azure. Um, as most of you know, uh, LinkedIn was acquired by Azure, and now we have a huge effort to move a lot of our data over to Azure. Um, and perhaps the biggest scale test for Brooklyn was the fact that it has fully replaced Kafka Mirror Maker at LinkedIn. So for those of you who are not familiar with Kafka Mirror Maker, it is a tool that is provided with open source Kafka that simply supports copying data from one Kafka cluster to another. And many companies use Kafka Mirror Maker for this purpose. But at LinkedIn, we were seeing a tremendous growth in the amount of Kafka data year over year. 
And Kafka Mirror Maker was just unable to scale up with the amount of Kafka data that we needed to handle. Um, it, it was difficult to operate and manage, and it had poor failure isolation, meaning that every time there was an issue with mirroring a particular Kafka topic or a particular Kafka partition, oftentimes the entire KMM cluster would fall over. And in fact, we were relying on a nanny job whose sole purpose was to detect when KMM clusters were down and simply restart them. So this just wasn't working well for LinkedIn at LinkedIn scale. And so because we already built a generic streaming service in Brooklyn, we decided to double down on Brooklyn and use it to mirror all of this Kafka data as well. So when I talk about Kafka mirroring pipelines with Brooklyn, those are simply Kafka, uh, Brooklyn pipelines that are configured with a Kafka source and a Kafka destination. And it was almost as simple as that. So by doing this, we were able to eliminate a lot of the comp complexity around all of this uh, KMM setup at LinkedIn. And this is best described by showing you an example of what the KMM topology used to look like at LinkedIn. Taking this specific example, where we want to mirror two types of data, um, tracking and metrics data, and we want to aggregate that into their respective aggregate tracking and aggregate metrics clusters um, in each of the three data centers, to do this with Kafka Mirror Maker, we needed 18 different KMM clusters to do this. So imagine that um, if you wanted to make a simple change, because of the fact that each Kafka Mirror Maker cluster can only support consuming from one Kafka cluster and writing to one Kafka cluster, um, we needed to support one cluster per pipeline, which is why we have 18 for this use case here. Um, and so suppose that if you wanted to make a simple change, so you wanted to add more topics to the whitelist of, let's say, the metrics to aggregate metrics pipelines. We had to do this in nine different places. For example, the, the bottom nine KMM clusters here. Um, because each one is controlled by a static config, we had to make this config change manually nine different times and then restart each KMM cluster for the change to take effect. But in reality, we have more than just metrics and tracking information that we want to mirror in LinkedIn. Um, and we have mo much more than just three data centers. So you can just really imagine the number of Kafka Mirror Maker clusters that we had to manage. It was actually in the hundreds. So this is uh, the same example, but using Brooklyn instead to mirror tracking and metrics data into their respective aggregate metrics and aggregate tracking pipe, uh, clusters in three data centers. We only need three Brooklyn cluster to, clusters to do this. Because Brooklyn is multi-tenant, it can handle multiple data pipelines within the same cluster. And so if you wanted to make a change, the same change um, by adding some topics to the metrics to aggregate metrics pipeline, you don't need to make a config change. In fact, this can be done dynamically. Um, and I'll show you this later with, uh, when I dive into the Brooklyn architecture. So Brooklyn Kafka, Brooklyn's solution for Kafka mirroring was really designed with operability and stability in mind. Um, but we did need to make some additional changes to Brooklyn to support this use case, despite the fact that we already had the ability to read and produce to Kafka. Originally, Brooklyn only supported reading from one particular source, like let's say one database table or one Kafka topic, and writing into one specific destination, like one Kafka topic. Um, but in order to support the Kafka mirroring scenarios and make it truly multi-tenant, we had to support we had to add support in Brooklyn to support a star-to-star -star or a many-to-many -many configuration, whereas where one pipeline could consume from thousands of topics and also mirror that data into thousands of topics. So in order to do this, we had to add a few more features to make it truly, um, to, to, to provide uh, true failure isolation, because we didn't want to repeat the same mistakes that were, uh, that we sort of introduced with our Kafka Mirror Maker setup, where every time there was an issue with mirroring one particular partition, the entire cluster would fall down. So we introduced the ability to manually pause and resume these Brooklyn pipelines at every granularity. So for example, you can pause or resume the entire pipeline, just a specific topic within that pipeline, or even just a particular partition within the stream. We also added the ability for Brooklyn to detect whenever it is hitting some issue in mirroring a particular partition or topic, and to auto-pause those 
partitions that are uh, facing these possibly transient issues. And Brooklyn can also automatically resume um, after a configurable duration. So this really eliminated the need to manually intervene whenever this happened, or we don't even rely on a nanny job to do this anymore. And the important thing to notice is that any time a pipeline um, topic or partition is paused, whether it be manually or automatically, the flow of messages from other partitions remain unaffected. So this is uh, truly multi-tenant and uh, has good failure isolation. So now that I've covered the um, change data capture and the streaming bridge scenarios which Brooklyn was intended for, um, I'd like to talk about some of the real use cases for Brooklyn within LinkedIn. One of the most common use cases for change data capture systems like Brooklyn is to keep a cache up to date. So for example, when, you want, when there's an update made to the real database, you want to make sure that that change is also reflected in the cache. Another example is search indices. So suppose that you uh, change your profile to reflect the fact that you now work at company X. Um, there can be a search application that listens to these changes and keeps some search indices fresh so that you no longer show up in the search results of your old company, but now you show up in the search results of your new company X. When you have a um, source of truth databases, sometimes you want to do some offline processing on this data. And one way to enable this is to ETL your data or uh, push this data into HDFS to do the offline processing. So you can ship these daily snapshots from your uh, database into HDFS. Um, but if you do this, your data could sort of become out of date really fast because you're only taking these snapshots every, at, at most every few hours. Um, so what you can do instead is you can consume from a Brooklyn change stream and then more periodically merge these live updates in with the uh, last snapshot that you've taken so that you can have a, a fresher perspective on the data. Another common use case is materialized views. So when you're modeling your database, you're often choosing primary keys that best fit the common access patterns of your application. But there might be another application whose access patterns differ from that. So what you can do is you can use Brooklyn to create a materialized view where Brooklyn consumes from once the, the source of truth, and then it sort of repartitions the data based on a new primary key that, you cho that you've chosen. So this is the same scenario, repartitioning here, where it doesn't have to be necessarily materialized, but Brooklyn can consume from one stream and then repartition that into another stream if you need a different partition count or if you need to partition by a different key. So I'll skip some through the rest of these um, application use cases for the interest of time, but I think um, most of these I've already covered. Now let's dive into the architecture of Brooklyn to see how uh, we we're able to achieve all of this. To do this, I'm going to take that same um, very simple example where we want to stream updates that are made to member profile data, namely this one here, where Brooklyn wants to capture live updates made to member database and then write them into Kafka where the news feed service can consume from to power this use case here to show uh, job updates on the news feed for all of Mo uh, Mochi's connections. So, in this case, the source database is Espresso, which is LinkedIn's document store. Um, and the destination is Kafka, and the application consuming from it is called the newsfeed service. So the most, uh, the, it's really important to understand the most fundamental concept of Brooklyn, which is a data stream. A data stream uh, is basically a logical concept that describes the data pipeline, and it is a mapping between the specific source and the specific destination. It also holds the configuration of the pipeline, for example, which application needs to consume it and who are the owners of, of this um, data stream. So to, to kick this off, um, to kick off the provisioning of a data pipeline, a service needs to create a data stream. Um, so in this case, the newsfeed service will go to our self-service UI portal, which we have in LinkedIn. It's a UI where application uh, developers can go to to select the particular source that they're interested in and the destination where they would like their data to end up in. So someone will go and uh, select uh, Espresso member profile in the UI and select Kafka as a destination. Um, and from there, uh, when they click Save, a create request will go 
and it'll hit one of our Brooklyn instances. Specifically, this request will go to the data stream management service, which is a REST endpoint that is exposed on all of our Brooklyn instances. And um, it can go to any, Brooklyn, any of these Brooklyn instances. So when the Brooklyn instance, um, the far left one in this case, receives that request, it simply writes, it simply serializes the data stream and writes it to Zookeeper. So Brooklyn's only dependency is Zookeeper, and we use this to store our metadata, namely our set of data streams, and we also use it for simple uh, coordination and leader election. So once this data stream is written into Zookeeper, the leader coordinator, which is the one that was um, designated as the leader at startup time by uh, Zookeep standard Zookeeper uh, election, leader election um, recipes, the leader is notified that this new data stream was written in Zookeeper. And what it does is it calculates the work distribution. So it can break up the data stream into what are known as data stream tasks or the actual work units of a data stream. So for example, if your data is partitioned, if your uh, source data is partitioned eight ways and it has eight partitions, for example, the leader coordinator could create eight different data stream tasks so that each task reads from a single partition. So once it just calculates the work distribution, the leader coordinator writes these assignments back into Zookeeper. So it writes, it serializes the data stream tasks um, and writes them to Zookeeper. Now, at this point in Zookeeper, um, each of the Brooklyn instances has one or more tasks and um, they get notified. They're listening to their own node in, in Zookeeper so they know when something new has been assigned to them. And so the coordinator, um, of each Brooklyn instance is now notified of these new tasks. So these tasks um, sort of each hold a copy of the original configuration of the data stream. So each of these tasks specify that um, they need to read from the member profile data and each task may uh, signal which partition that the Brooklyn instance should consume from. So how does the coordinator know which consumer to hand how does each coordinator within the Brooklyn instance know which consumer to hand off these tasks to? Well, the data stream definition had Espresso as a source, so it knows that it needs to hand off these tasks to the Espresso consumer. And once these Espresso consumers receive the tasks, they can start to process the data from the source. So they can each start to consume from their uh, assigned partitions um, and start reading the data. So once they read, start streaming the data out of the data source, um, they propagate this data over to the producers. And the way that they know which producers to hand off the data to is within the data stream definition again. Um, this time Kafka is the destination, so these consumers know that they need to pass along their events over to the Kafka producers. Once the Kafka producers receive these events from the consumers, they can all write to Kafka. And once the data uh, once the first, date of the first event hits Kafka, um, the apps, or in this case, the newsfeed service, can start to consume from Kafka asynchronously. And as I mentioned before, Kafka provides good read scaling. So in the case that multiple applications need to, or they're interested in consuming changes from member profile data, they can each follow the steps that I mentioned before. Uh, from step one, they can go to the self-service UI portal and request that. But Brooklyn actually has um, some, what is called as uh, data stream du deduplication logic inside it so that it knows that if there are many, like hundreds of applic application teams wanting to consume from member profile data, it can reuse the same data stream tasks and all of the same underlying physical resources, including the same destination Kafka topic. So it'll just automatically point all of these new applications over to the existing Kafka topic that it that was already created for uh, the newsfeed service use case. And Brooklyn also does some um, ACL management as well. So it, ca it can ensure that only the applications who have been accepted to consume from this uh, data source um, can actually consume from the Kafka destination. So stepping away from this specific example, at a high level, this is what the Brooklyn architecture looks like. Um, and this, in this case, you only see three Brooklyn instances here, but um, at LinkedIn, we manage Brooklyn clusters that are like over 600 instances wide. Um, so here, 
There are some main components of, of Brooklyn. Uh, Zookeeper, as I mentioned before, is used to store all of the metadata as well as do some uh, coordination. Um, the data stream management service is a REST endpoint that allows users to dynamically act upon certain data pipelines like create, update, read, delete, pause partitions, pause data pipelines, resume them, um, and also to retrieve um, like uh, statistics about the pipelines. We can also do that uh, dynamically. Uh, each Brooklyn instance has what is known as the coordinator, which is the brains of the system, which is responsible for, uh, the leader is responsible for calculating and distributing the tasks. The coordinators, the other coordinators are responsible for uh, reading these data stream tasks and then sort of distributing them to where necessary. Um, each Brooklyn instance can be configured with any number of consumers, as in if you want to read from Espresso, Oracle, Kafka, Event Hubs, you would configure your Brooklyn um, cluster to have four different types of consumers. Um, in the same respect, uh, Brooklyn can also be configured with any number of different types of producers. So if you need to write to any variety of destinations like Event Hubs, Kinesis, Kafka, you can just configure your uh, Brooklyn cluster with those producers. And these consumer and producer APIs are standardized in a way that it's very easy to um, extend these APIs to easily add support for new sources and destinations, which was one of the main goals that we had when we started Brooklyn. <clears throat> so now that uh, you have a, an idea of the architecture, um, I'll talk about where Brooklyn is today and what plans we have um, going forward for it. Currently, Brooklyn supports a variety of consumers. We have Espresso, Oracle, Kafka, Event Hubs, and Kinesis. And it also supports uh, two destinations, namely Kafka and Event Hubs. Some of the features of Brooklyn um, are that, first, uh, is that it's multi-tenant. It can power thousands of data streams across various sources and destinations. Um, we do guarantee at least once delivery, um, meaning that we guarantee that each event is guaranteed at least once to the destination. And ordering of these events are guaranteed and maintained at a per partition level. For the huge Kafka mirroring use case, um, to, to replace Kafka Mirror Maker, we had to add finer support, finer control of data pipelines, like the ability to pause and auto-pause partitions. And we've also introduced some features that improve the latency, such as uh, something called flushless produce mode, wherein we um, avoid calling producer.flush, which is a blocking call on the Kafka producers. Um, and this has helped improve our latency and what is known as Kafka rebalances. Brooklyn in production today, Brooklyn is in production today and has been in production since um, 2016. And Brooklyn streams within uh, Brooklyn streams with Espresso or Oracle as its source. Um, we propagate thir over 38 billion messages a day, over 2,000 data streams, um, which is over 1,000 unique sources because of that data stream deduplication um, feature that I mentioned earlier. And we are supporting uh, over 200 applications within LinkedIn. For Brooklyn, um, supporting, for, for Brooklyn clusters mirroring Kafka data, uh, we are doing over 3 trillion messages a day, um, spanning over 200 mirroring data pipelines, and we are mirroring tens of thousands of Kafka topics. Um, and I'm happy to announce that since June of this year, um, Brooklyn is now open source and is on GitHub. But our work is not done. We still want to um, add more support for new sources and destinations. Namely, on the source side, we want to support MySQL, Cosmos DB, and Azure SQL, to name a few. And on the uh, destination side, we want to write to Azure Blob Storage, Kinesis, Cosmos DB, Azure SQL, and Couchbase. And the interesting thing about these destinations is that some of these are storage, where in um, previously our destinations were Event Hubs and Kafka, so there are more streaming messaging systems. So we'll introduce some new features in Brooklyn to allow uh, for batching to support these uh, storage destinations. And we want to optimize Brooklyn even further. We want to add ability for Brooklyn to auto scale um, automatically based on the throughput needs of the data pipelines in near real time. Um, we also want to roll out this feature called pass-through compression, so which will help the throughput by at least 5x for our Kafka mirroring scenarios. 
Um, so when you mirror Kafka data from one cluster to another, it's very simple. It's just a, we just want to have a big fat pipe that mirrors bytes of data from one place to another. But the problem is that the Kafka consumer, um, which is the, you know, the Kafka client in open source Kafka, um, the Kafka consumer, what it does is it automatically uh, deserializes all of the events that are read, and then, it re and then the Kafka producer reserializes that data um, when producing to the destination. So this uh, serialization, deserialization and serialization takes up actually over 70% of our CPU, and um, we don't care about the message, the event uh, boundaries in this case because we are simply mirroring. We're not doing any data processing. We're not looking into the payload of these Kafka events. So we want to do what's called pass-through compression where and we disable the deserialization and the reserialization of these messages and we simply uh, write bytes, bytes out and bytes in. Um, so this would, we've uh, shown that this can give us a 5x throughput increase. Another thing that we want to do is we want to make some read optimizations where we want to be able to read once and write to multiple destinations. So in the case that I mentioned earlier where all of these application teams are consuming from the same Kafka destination because they're all interested in member profile data, um, there may be some cases where they don't want to share the same underlying topic. And in this case, we want to be able to read from Espresso once and then write to maybe 10 different Kafka topics. But the challenge with that is that, as I mentioned, each application can be at their own pace. So we need to be able to handle that too. Um, lastly, I just want to thank all of you again for choosing to attend my presentation. Um, I think I have three minutes for any questions. But if you have any questions outside, please feel free to find me or um, message me on any of these channels. You can message me on LinkedIn. You can send me a direct email to my LinkedIn email address. Or you can ask um, questions on our GitHub, or sorry, in our Gitter channel. We're really active on Gitter. Um, and you can check out our source code um, on GitHub. Thank you. Yeah, so the question is, um, can, we, can people easily write their own um, consumers and producers to, uh, that are maybe outside of the scope of what we have in the future? Um, and yes, the answer is yes. We're open source now, so anyone is free to contribute. The APIs are pretty standard, so it's, I'm sorry? What language? What language? Okay, so right now we support Java. Yeah, uh, Brooklyn is written completely in Java. Yeah, so the question is um, that Brooklyn seems to have a lot of over overlap with Kafka Connect and Debezium. Um, some of the features that I think are a little bit unique about Brooklyn is that, so let's say Kafka Connect, for example. I think um, with Kafka Connect, you can configure a, a, con a connector with it, but if you configure a source, or a, yeah, if you configure a source, then the sync is automatically Kafka. And if you configure a sync, then the source is automatically Kafka. So you can do either source or destination as Kafka, and then the other one can be something else. Whereas Brooklyn can stream anything from X to Y. So we don't even need to involve Kafka there. Uh, Debezium is, um, from my understanding, it is known more for change data capture, which is um, you can easily write plugins to consume from a variety of databases. Um, but Brooklyn can also read from messaging systems. It can do uh, batching so that it can write back into data stores. Um, and it can do Kafka to Kafka, um, event hubs to Kinesis. Um, I think it's, if I were to summarize, I think it's a little bit more uh, customizable. Yeah. Uh, you um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, what is the question around? Yeah, so, um, for example, oh, so the question is, um, can I give some examples of policies and how they are enforced? Um, so, you, for example, if you have a particular um, data set that is um, private, you can um, say that this needs to be encrypted, and therefore you can, there's a way for you to, uh, 
to configure your data pipelines to let Brooklyn know that this is an encrypted data stream and that it may need to read the keys for that source from a particular key management service. Um, and then also when it ships the events, it needs to also use that same key to encrypt those messages. And the applications also need to use their, that key to decrypt it on the other end. And so at LinkedIn, we have services like uh, a key management service, um, which enables us to do this. So it's all within the configuration of a data pipeline. Uh, yep. Yes. Uh, okay, so the question is, is there any initiative to push Brooklyn over to Apache? Um, Apache is something that we did evaluate, um, but going forward as a company, LinkedIn is, is, um, is moving away from Apache. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.